Vito Russo talked about it in his review of the second festival in 1988, and it was that review that I found so compelling and mysterious, and what is this film that he's talking about that has no picture? And E. Hart is here now, too. Um, I was reading this review, and uh, it's what made me write a letter to Jim Hubbard uh, that began our relationship and uh, my relationship with Mix, ultimately. So, um, special film for me in that way. Um, so, but let's, uh, let's have E. Hart introduce herself now, since we missed you at the beginning. Hi, sorry, I missed the train. So I got here just as Jim was saying, did you say 39 years in the making? That's amazing. It's very cool. Thank you. I'm E. Hart. What's then your film? Oh, sorry, my film was unexplained as yet. The one that has the footage of the giant squid. That was the giant squid, not just regular squid, the giant squid. <laughs> We have a question right here in the front. Yeah. I have a question for. I have a question for Jim Hubbard. <laughs> um, so I was incredibly inspired from a lot of your films that were silent and were very incredibly intimate and seemingly all-encompassing in what certain movements have been, and focusing very directly on facial expressions and this certain intimacy that, you know, I don't really see anywhere else. And so, when you went with your transition from film to video, although you're probably using a lot of footage that was originally film as well, you know, what, you know, I see a lot of correlation through that, but necessarily, like, what, it, was there a different sort of relationship that you had from composing it entirely behind the lens, through film, developing yourself and doing this, and sort of like reaching back into footage that you would already play to, and sort of like, I want to know more about what that process was for you, and, um, you know, how I to understand it. Um, that's a complicated question. Um, there, there, well, there are two basic things. I mean, first of all, I've been working in video a bit, having me in under the anger on the video. But um, the two aspects of it are utterly different. One is that with film and the processing, it's a completely tactile process. That constantly touching and mixing the chemicals and spending hours um, um, bent over the processing machine. Um, in, in hailing cancerous uh, material, <laughs> fumes, um, and that's completely ab absent. So it, there, there's, um, I was just do, you know doing sitting at the computer pressing buttons and like oh let's see what this does, um, and then and then choosing. So so it's it, um, it's kind of the opposite relationship to the material. What, yeah, what I would say about that that I think is interesting is in hand processing, you give up a lot of control in many ways about what's going to happen. And I think what was happening in Footsteps on the Ceiling is you were able to create a very specific nomenclature of, sim of symbols that related to what the footage you were choosing, which would be harder to do, I think, in, 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 in hand processing. I don't think you would be able to achieve these, and you wouldn't be able to. And that's, that's really that's the beauty of medium specificity. Um, although, although it was it was a process, a process of trial and error, which is very related to um, hand processing. Although I always, you know, I I don't like the idea that you um, give up control because I don't think that's entirely the case. In fact, when you, you gain control when you process the film, when, when normally when you send film out to the laboratory, it comes back looking the way they want it to look, and. In, when you process this on yourself, it looks the way you want it to look. But I'm thinking, <laughs> but I'm thinking, for example, in two marches, there's that sequence, this, this really beautiful sequence of a marching band that's blue. It was not what you intended, but as soon as you saw it, you knew this is actually perfect, and maybe somehow it was intended. Right, well, there are, there are always those happy, the, well, the happy accidents. I mean, what happened there is that something screwed up in the machine, and it was just stuck, and so I was fussing with the machine and, and the film wasn't moving from the tanks and, and so there's this checkerboard uh, process.
processing to the phone. Maybe there are more questions. Well, if you go like this, you actually can't can see. see. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everyone has spent the entire festival. <laughs> so, Jerry, I was wondering if, if you could speak more about your relationship to Roger and Agent Wood and how that related. What? 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 <laughs> um, when Undine left Roger in Pittsburgh and came to New York, Roger expected me to tell Undine to go back to Pittsburgh into the arms of Roger. Mm. I didn't, and Roger never forgave me for it. Mm. <laughs> you know, I've never heard that story. Well, <laughs> let's not fumble for excuses now that we have our hair down. <laughs> Roger's side of the story <laughs> was that he left, left on me. <laughs> I don't know. Not, not very little of their relationship ever made any sense. You, <laughs> um, what was the name of the dog, Saint Bernard, and the you know the story of the um, the Puerto Rican junkies and the, and the. I don't remember the name of the dog. I don't remember the dog either. The, anyway, the way they ended up in Pittsburgh was that. Um, the, the dog, remember the dog was kidnapped. <laughs> and, and Roger was running around, um, running around Brooklyn looking for the dog. And it was, it was like this drooling St. Bernard, whose name we can't remember. And, and he found it in the, the um, Andine was in these, uh, in the apartment with, and it was always this phrase, Puerto Rican junkies. Right? You know, objectionable as it is. But, it was really weird because, you know, Andine was, was an amphetamine head, and A-heads and junkies never had anything to do with each other. So the story makes no sense. But anyway, Roger went after the dog, and he found it at these people's house, and he, um, there was a fight, and somebody picked up an iron table and hit Roger over the head with it. Right, and he spent the next three days wandering around Brooklyn with this uh, fractured skull mm. and they finally got him to the hospital and what the, and the doctor said that they wouldn't let him out of the hospital unless he agreed to move to Pittsburgh which is another thing that you know doctors <laughs> <laughs> anyway. there's also you know the other relationship to history is that it's all lies <laughs> uh, um. you know this is the kind of conversations that I wish we'd had more at festivals uh, so I'd like to ask the filmmakers to, to ask a question of each other rather than having us ask you questions because this is also the kind of thing that Nix does to bring these kind of filmmakers together. And you're in a queer space rather than a festival space. So what would you like to ask, you know, one of the other people? <laughs> Putting us on the spot even more than we were before. <laughs> well, let me give you a little help. All right, Margot Channing is a generational sort of icon, and um, and so Jean's film really represents for for lesbians what we haven't, which many gay men didn't know that they had the same sort of curiosity that that gay men have for, for Margot Channing. So what today, with all of our assimilation, you know, what does the artist, uh, uh, the filmmaker, who do you go after to sort of grab in your imaginations, old imaginations or young imaginations? But you're the youngest, so why don't you tell us what's going on now, <laughs> since we all live in the past. <laughs> oh, um, well, I don't know. I think it's quite interesting that a lot of this was actually uh, pulling from history 
like um, my film, of course, had a very old quote from it, but all of that is still completely relevant today. Like I read that quote, and that really speaks to me and how I feel. And I think that's something that's really interesting is actually the, this long, long, long history and how that is 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 where a lot of people draw inspiration is actually from the past that is completely relevant and happening in the present. I don't know, <laughs> but when I was watching my film and in the whole movie, that was my confirmation. And I remembered that I wanted my father's second cousin, Anthony, from Ozone Park, to be my confirmation sponsor because he was so gay. He was the guy playing the piano also. And my mother absolutely was against it. And it was, it was like, I was, Betty Davis and now Voyager standing up to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I got my, my gay, closeted gay, but uh, gay cousin, twice removed, uh, to be my sponsor. And then the other thing I thought about, which was kind of weird, and I don't know how much I really want to go into this now, but the Lenny Riefenstahl thing, <laughs> it sort of hit me, you know, strong-willed women, Italian opera, movies. I thought, I gotta think about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can save us all because we're actually out of time. Oh, oh, wait. Well, wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait. Oh. First, uh, don't you want to mention that since Fran Liebowitz was mentioned, that there are items for sale by mix, design by Fran? <laughs> Nothing, Nothing by Fran Liebowitz. No shirt? Karen Finley. Karen Finley. I get them confused. <laughs> that's, that's great. Nelson's trying to push our Artist Made t shirts by Scott Trey Levin, Karen Finley, and Stephen Lack, which are available at Hospitality. Limited Edition hand painted wonderful things. I have one other question I'd like to ask is that watching these films, seeing you in, 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 the, in one of the demonstrations, seeing people that are dead alive on the screen, uh, which is one of the gifts of queer filmmaking, how does that affect the filmmakers? I know how it affects me, but I want to know how it affects you. I felt pretty crappy that everybody in the film except me is dead. And the, there's a whole lost generation. You know, I mean, we're sort of recovering it in some ways, but it really is a lost generation. And not now because we're out of time, but gay male history has always been, excuse the expression, an oral tradition. And we really did pass it one generation to the next. And this generation got skipped. And that's problematic in the long run. But maybe we can somehow help that. Let's go have a drink and then continue this conversation. And we'll say Jerry, we're trying. We're trying.